Acute ischemic stroke is the third leading cause of mortality in Western civilization, and it's the uh, number one leading cause of uh, chronic disability in the Western civilizations. Patients after stroke are in a severe trauma. In, in second, just in second, they can lose almost everything. They became for a completely normal, healthy person who, walk, who, who is going to work every day, who is doing all the sports and everything he can, suddenly they became disabled person. They lost their ability to speak, their ability to, to think, to walk, to use the hand, to live their life. And it happens suddenly. There is no preparation for this. It's an acute trauma to the patient and, of course, to the family. One of the main problems of stroke therapies is the short therapeutic time. Most of the patients that suffer from stroke remain in their homes or they just look for, they call, it, call an ambulance or look for a taxi in order to get to the hospital. They lose or they waste a lot of time in, in, in the meanwhile and they just simply come late to receive their treatment. Stroke affects about 1 million Americans per year, similar numbers in Europe, and about 15,000 Israelis per year every year. Stroke can affect everybody and anybody and at any age group, but it is more common in the age group between 60 and 80. There are risk factors for stroke, hypertension, high cholesterol levels, diabetes, smoking, and overweight, and obesity. So if you treat those uh, risk factors, if, uh, you can prevent stroke from occurring. 85 to 90 percent of all strokes occur from a blockage of an artery leading blood to the brain either in the neck or in the brain itself. These cases are called ischemic strokes. The remaining 10 to 15 percent of all strokes are hemorrhagic in nature and they result from a rupture of a blood vessel and then entrance of blood into the brain uh, itself. Strokes are very dangerous and can lead to mortality. The risk for mortality is about 4 to 6 percent for acute ischemic stroke and about 40 percent for hemorrhagic stroke. The most common symptoms for a stroke are motor uh, and they reflect in weakness or um, paralysis of one or uh, more of the limbs like for instance right leg, right arm and a facial droop, facial asymmetry that develops and also there could be uh, language uh, problems with inability to find the appropriate words, inability to talk or incoherent uh, speech that develops and also vertigo and any other focal neurological symptoms can represent a stroke. The real revolution in the management of stroke started back in the 90s when neurologists discovered that by giving intravenous TPA one third of the patients with acute stroke can improve clinically. This was the first evidence that we had at least a viable treatment for those patients presenting with stroke. Before that time, patients used to receive only water and oxygen, no more than that. TPA breaks the clot, so if there's a clot that occludes one of the blood vessels leading to the brain or in the brain, TPA just breaks the clot and then restores blood flow to the ischemic brain. TPA also has some drawbacks and it may increase the risk of uh, hemorrhage into the brain after an ischemic stroke. And this risk is about 2 to 4 percent of all patients that receive TPA. We know that intravenous medications can improve patient's condition, but with two problems. These medications have to be administered in the first three hours, a very short therapeutic window. Most of the patients are going to come afterward. And on the other side, this IV medication is not very useful for patients with major vessel occlusions. We can reopen big arteries after this three hours short therapeutic window by doing angiographic recanalizations. The most important thing is that we have to act fast. Most of the patients are supposed to be treated in the first six to eight hours upon the beginning of his stroke symptoms. The patients that are going to be treated here are going to be patients with sudden occlusions of one of the arteries of their brain. 
most of the arteries that we reopen are big arteries. There is another subset of patients with stroke, those patients with bleeding aneurysms. And this is another type of patients that are going to be benefited with these state-of-the-art technologies. When the patient is here, we basically perform a study of the arteries of his brain, we localize the occlusion, and we remove the clot that occluded this vessel. We work in very small arteries with a diameter of one, two, or three millimeters. In order to perform every procedure, we just place this device that is called introducer sheath through the femoral artery that is located at the left of the groin of the patient. This is our access point. We perform every procedure entering into the patient's body through the leg. We go all the way up and reach the arteries of the neck. From there, a very small and tiny microcatheter, a tube like this one, is navigated through the vessels of the brain. As you can see here, for example, we are seeing here a patient, three years old of age. Here you see the microcatheter, and we are navigating it all the way up through the small vessels of the brain. This is a case of a 21-year-old woman came to us with a major stroke that she suffered immediately after a completely normal delivery. You can see the complete occlusion of the right middle cerebral artery. A couple of minutes afterward, we just cross the occlusion with a small microcatheter. We recognized that we are already in normal arteries beyond the occlusion. We remove the clot with this thrombectomy device and then this is the immediate injection after the removal of the clot showing complete re revascularization of the artery. Today's good news is that after less than eight hours I have re-examined this patient and she's completely normal. She can move her right uh, arm and leg, she can, she can talk completely normal and she was basically uh, breastfeeding her baby. After they are passing the acute phase in neurology or neurosurgery, they are coming to us in rehabilitation. And we are trying to adjust them to the new situation and to help them to improve their life to the better condition they can. For this, we are using the reserve in the brain, the brain reserve. We call it now brain plasticity. The ability of the brain to adjust itself to the new condition. And we in rehabilitation, we are trying to do best thing to improve the brain plasticity. And we are doing it with conventional therapy, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and with a new technology and technique. We are using brain stimulation. We are using transmagnetic stimulation to enhance the brain activity of a lesion hemisphere after a stroke. We can also suppress the normal hemisphere that will not interfere with the rehabilitation process. We also use robotic here. We have a robotic for gait to improve the gait of our patient. We conducted a three main trials using a robotic for, for gait in stroke patients, in patients with spinal cord injury, and in multiple sclerosis patients. And we show that if you add the robotic treatment, together with the normal physiotherapy, regular physiotherapy, where you can improve the function of the patient. They can walk better. They can be more independent. We have robotic for the hands to improve the gain function. We use also environmental like virtual reality environment that patient can play and can do also therapy during the virtual reality treatment. And this is together with the regular treatment improve the function of the patient. And this is the idea here, interdisciplinary teamwork that means together with the patient, together with the family, to improve his function and to bring him home in the best condition, back to his family, back to his work, back to his value and to give him strength to fight against the acute episode, the acute trauma, the acute stress that he is in. And in the future we know that there will be more and more combination of technique and a treatment that will improve the brain plasticity.